So any any questions about uh, the the homework? There's a homework. <laughs> FYI. So it, it, it's on the system craptography, right? We need to do the zero through four problems. Zero three. You have like other things, but I I only just glanced at the class. Zero through three. Yeah, the so hard so problems, probably. No, no, not, not the hard problems, just what's okay. labeled homework one. Start. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Desktop. So, infinite regressive desktop. So yeah, if if uh, if you haven't tried this, I mean, crypto, it uh, ho hopefully it's still working. Anybody have any strange problems with crypto that like it uses the same login as net run? So hopefully everybody's on that. That's that's how I do the grades as well. Okay, yeah, it's and it's it's sort of this bizarre little brain damage version of RC5, the restricted RC5 that uh, that, that I put together there. It uh, I, I keep doing this actually. The the key schedule is something we're going to have to cover at some point. And because uh, I'm I've just been skipping over it so far, uh, but uh, but I mean the the idea is to get you have, have some hands-on experience actually running you know crypto code from somebody else. Uh, let's see, and then uh, yeah, there's a couple of couple of uses of that thing. It's due. Uh, you have a week, so let's see. Yeah, it's a week from today, so right. Uh, and and that's because I was sort of uh, so dangerous thing about uh, uh, crypto. Like, uh, I'm, I'm always really concerned that I'm going to uh, ask somebody an unsolvable problem. <laughs> because it, it will have encrypted, like, some binary data that includes zero, you know, uh, nulls at the end or something. Because I screwed up the quoting in the shell where I prepare these things. And then it's going to, it's you know, you'll have decrypted all the ASCII text, but not the missing ASCII null at the end. And it'll say, no, you can't do that. And if you paste in the null, it'll say, just skip over the null or something silly. So... If it, uh, if it fails miserably and you can't figure out why it's failing miserably because you think, like, gosh, this really should work, uh, please definitely let me know. That's part of the reason there's a longer deadline before this uh, this project actually starts, or the, the, uh, uh, the homework is uh, is ready. So any, any questions on that other homework? What, uh, and, yeah, so let's see. So, so today, uh, today's lecture is on uh, basically FISAL structured ciphers. So FISAL structure, this is exactly the structure we're using in RC5. So you, you start with uh, <coughs> divvying up your plaintext in two halves, usually two ints, right, or two longs, or two, two chunks. And then, I mean, it's really strange, because uh, we just use XOR uh, on, on the one chunk. And it's it's any function. It doesn't have to be an invertible function. This is the beautiful part about uh, Feistel. You don't need inversion, which means you can actually, like, destroy bits or whatever in here. You can, you can have a really uh, difficult to cryptanalyze function uh, for your, uh, 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 to, to, to convert. And uh, <coughs> XOR. We saw last time, I mean, just plain XOR, one-step XOR, is totally vulnerable to a, uh, like, a differential cryptanalysis type attack, right? This is not, this is not the safest thing in the world, right? So what, uh, what's the deal? Right? In other words, if, if I change the low bit of the plain text, at the end of the first round, the low bit of the ciphertext is different, guaranteed. And, and no other changes, which is really bad, right? So, so they, they can restrict what's uh, what's happened. So the trick for Feistel is you just repeat this, right? So basically, the the, the right hand washes the left, <laughs> and then and then repeat, right? So I, I take this new modified value, and that gets input into this uh, uh, the uh, the same permutation function potentially. So so lots of cool things about this actually. So for example, uh, aside from the key schedule, which just runs in the opposite order, there's no difference between encryption and decryption. It's right? same exact operation, which which is good. Uh, you, you really don't want like a symmetric key schedule because then encryption and decryption literally are the same operation, <laughs> and then then it's possible to get tricked into decrypting stuff when you think you're encrypting stuff. Uh, so so uh, again, key schedule uh, is, is really important. Any questions about this? So, so how many times do you have to go back and forth? Totally depends on basically how secure this is and what the various attacks seem to be. So like a dozen seems like pretty. So RC5 uses a dozen. Uh, uh, DES used, uh, it claims it's 16. But the, the, there's some debate as to how, how you count the bits, etc. there. But like, I mean, so, so, so the trick is if I flipped about half the bits here, and then I take about half those flip bits and I flip about half the bits here, and then I repeat that a couple of times. 
I mean, hopefully it's going to be pretty unpredictable what the heck happens at, uh, at the end of doing this. So uh, lots and lots of options available for your sort of political function here. What, uh, what's the obvious one that you should start by thinking about? I want a function to take my key in my uh, plain text and then, you know, converts it and gives me an output. And? Uh, and? and uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so pick, pick any bitwise operator. Heck, uh, I mean, like XOR. Let's do XOR. XOR is a little dangerous, right? Because, uh, so, so essentially I have, yeah, left is XOR of key and right. And now I have uh, right gets XORed with, uh, uh oh, it back into itself again. So you can, it, it's, it's, if, 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 the, if this function is sufficiently sort of, you know, straight through, you can get in trouble, right? You can get to the point where this is actually just flipping this thing back and forth. So for example, if, so, uh, easiest to analyze these things if you take a key schedule of all zeros. That's usually a terrible idea. It's, it's, it's a good way to see uh, where, where stuff where stuff will take off. So the key schedule is all zero, and I'm just doing XOR, and then, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, left gets XOR with right. Uh, right gets XOR with left and right, which gets you back to right. Try it. Right, uh, let's see. Well, you end up with the left there, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I think you end up, uh, like, uh, you'll either have left, XOR, right, uh, or just uh, you know left or right. You won't have you won't have anything actually happening. Right? Uh, so so some some sort of combination function there is uh, is good. So for example, RC five. Right. I don't know if you remember RC five, but it's uh, uh, bit shift. Rotate left. And I'm I'm gonna rotate the key. Some combination of the uh, uh, what happened here? You add the key. You rotate by B. So I take I take basically A rotate, rotate by B. And this is the that's that's the thing uh, ends up uh, XOR. So uh, right, so, so some some plain XOR in there is we or not this is strong enough. It, you could imagine, I mean, the, I guess the most general cipher. I don't even know if it has a name. Uh, you, you have a round based uh, cipher. You have three inputs, right? Uh, you have basically the, the left, the key, and the right come in, and then you have two outputs, right? These are the left and right sides, or you have. Some data comes in, some key comes in, they get mixed together. That's the, again, it doesn't really have a name. R round, round based cipher, just keep, uh, keep mixing those things together. So lots of Faisal ciphers out there. Uh, RC5 was one that we, that we looked at. Uh, one of the big ones was data, the data encryption standard. So the DS, and this was, this was kind of the standard cipher for a lot of years. It, uh, it dates back to 1977, same year I was born, right? In other words, it's really old. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> but it, it, it seems to actually have, uh, have, have worked out okay. So it starts with 64 bits of plain text, in other words, two ints, uh, which is exactly like our, our C, uh, RC5. Uh, and we basically just, uh, so you can see, uh, we run the uh, uh, Feistel uh, type, type thing 16 times, 16 rounds. Output of each one is XORed with the uh, one half of the input, and then hopefully at the end there's nothing there's nothing left. To, to reverse, you just uh, flip the key schedule around backwards and then do the same set of operations. So th this was designed for like, like uh, in hardware, people really like these. Because uh, I can compute some function, right, on build one copy of that, uh, that function circuit, and now I can basically do just, you know, I, I, I uh, I run that circuit 16 times, cycle through the inputs, uh, basically feed, feed the inputs back in, and that, uh, that circuit does its thing. I can make a higher performance implementation if I have 16 copies of this. And now I can like pipeline the data through there. So basically, as, as soon as I'm done with the first, uh, first pair, I just stick in another set of data to start, start encrypting, and then uh, those will be percolating through. So it, 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 when, when all these stages are full, I can move 16 of them at once. So and, and, and you can you can actually scale all the way between having like a cell phone implementation, or maybe you'll have one copy of the uh, the, the nonlinear function, or a, uh, a high performance like a desktop or an ASIC implementation where you have 16 copies or as many as you need. Right. Uh, so parallelism. Uh, right. So so the actual function they used was surprisingly weird. It, it was actually really famously weird, and for like decades people were like, "What are they trying to pull over on us here?" Uh, so here's the function for DES. This is the, uh, the what's, uh, what's 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 basically happening there. So the, the, there's an expansion that basically there's a really good picture of 
what's happening in the bits here. So I take a 30, 32 bits of data. That's that's the my, my source. I actually expand that up to 48 bits by just replicating about half the bits, right? Uh, and and it's it's in a nice systematic way. I look up these six bit entries in a six to four lookup table. And, and this is totally non-invertible, this step, which is kind of good, right? That uh, in, perfect invertibility is not necessarily something you need. And, and, and with Feistel, I mean, the, the basic deal with Feistel is you've reconstructed this, and you can recompute all this stuff. So, so there is going to be a really non-linear output. And it's actually, I mean, here it is, uh, you know, it's almost 40 years later, and it's still pretty good, right? Pretty, uh, 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 not much progress in sort of, uh, you know, uh, cryptographic breaks on this thing because these substitutions are just pretty dang nonlinear. In fact, they're kind of carefully chosen to be as nonlinear as you, you can get. So, so the substitutions are just these little lookup tables, and then the, the final permutation just basically shuffles, shuffles some bits around. So the, uh, if, if you look at what these look like, uh, so here's the tables, which this is really unilluminating. <laughs> So I have eight, eight different tables on eight different sets of bits. For some reason, in Wikipedia at least, they've, uh, they've said, here's the middle bits that you've pulled out, and then here's the bits on the end. It kind of makes it a pain in the butt to extract the thing into a sort of normal table. Uh, the, uh, so, so the, this is because the expansion phase, where's the expansion? Phase. So here's the expansion function. Right? I start with 32 bits of the input and end with 48 bits of these temporary values, right? And it's eight six-bit quantities. Six, eight, 48. Uh, so what's happening here is that four bits basically just go straight through into the middle, and then the two bits on the on the outsides come from well, it's the adjacent uh, the adjacent one. So, so I, I start with four bits. Those four, four bits go straight through, and those get looked up directly in the table. And then the adjacent bits also come in as uh, as entries in the table. So if I have two of these, what happens is uh, right uh, there they are, and then I take the you know the the outermost bits actually get uh, get interchanged there. So kind of a weird, interesting structure to the thing. Uh, I think the idea is just to provide more uh, paths through this table that are all going to get combined. Uh, so we, we look this thing up. I mean, you notice the table, you, you can't have an invertible permutation, right? There's it's six bits in, four bits out. There's just, you're, you're going to have to have, a, you know, there's a way to get a 15, there's another way to get a 15, there's another way to get a 15. So you have several possible you know, uh, ways to do this. There's no obvious relationship between the different rows, which again, it's a feature. So, so right, I, I have these bits that I'm trying to hide, and uh, the the bits around it actually determine how you've how you've uh, permuted the thing. So, so this is good, right? And uh, I mean, in general, you could imagine building a Faisal structured cipher where you just take 32 bits of input and you're running through a thir you know two to the 32nd entry lookup table, and you come up with just just this crazily shifted version of the. So, uh, I don't know of any ciphers that do that. Funny. Why not? In other words, Feistel structure. I have two two halves. I'll call them A and B. I have to take B, run it through some some function. Maybe I've combined in a, some some bits of the key, and then that's going to get XOR with A. So this can be anything, and in fact, sort of the more nonlinear this is, the better off you are because that hides the key and, and protects your B. So this thing should so uh, four billion entry lookup table, pluses minuses. The plus is now all the bits of the input contribute to all the bits of the output, which actually sounds great. Right here, it's actually sort of bundled up in these little structured chunks. Four billion entries, like a really large <laughs> story of memory. Yeah, about how big is it, right? You get 32 bits per entry, four bytes, four billion entries. It's 16 gigs. You can put it in RAM on a lot of desktop machines nowadays. Yeah, but what about your cell phone? Not on your cell phone, yeah. On the cell phone, you couldn't use. It's also not very fast because you can't use. Yeah. You can throw that in your cache. Yeah, uh, speed's another big issue, right? So. Uh, Right, uh, so here, here I have this Feistel function, and it, it gets it has to get looked up like you know a dozen times or something per two ints that you're that you're looking up. So if every time you're having to go to RAM because you have this 16 gig 
lookup table, you're kind of in trouble. There's there's another so so I mean you might say well we'll have two overlapping 30-bit tables. Uh, let's see. 28-bit tables, right? Make it make it as small as you need to fit on a cell phone. So now you'll have one gig. Where does that table come from? How do you trust the entries in that table? How do you validate that uh, there's no paths through there? Right? If, uh, if if I come with certain values, that uh, the table just breaks and ends up giving me unencrypted data, for example. It, it, it just gets a lot harder to validate the bigger your tables get, which is which is nice. So, so validation tables is important. They actually really carefully structure these things so that uh, there, there aren't any of the patterns that uh, the cryptanalysis techniques rely on. Uh, and in fact, it was kind of interesting because in the 1970s, uh, apparently IBM worked with the NSA some to figure out, and it's still not clear who's who was actually responsible for making it stronger. But uh, they they basically made it where you know they in the 80s, 90s they came with more stuff. Stuff didn't work on DS because these tables have been designed to be robust against this stuff, which is awesome, right? So it's it's stronger than it looks, and the design of these things is pretty subtle. They actually uh, there's an interesting paper that shows that like if you just kind of flip any of these, I mean it doesn't really look like it changes anything. But uh, if, if, if you manage to, I mean, most of the flips make this thing weaker against the analysis techniques that uh, that we know about. So hey, I mean, they're they're fairly carefully designed. So so that's so that's that's great. Uh, lookup tables. Validating them is hard, right? It's not not easy to design a good lookup table that uh, that isn't going to have some some hidden flaw. And uh, the, the other problem is 1977. People didn't really trust. You know, this is the post Nixon era. This this was the sort of uh, people didn't trust the government terribly much. The government says like here use these lookup tables. Now, the thing is, the government is actually saying, I mean, the reason they published this thing is the data encryption standard was because the government has lots of secrets that need to be protected. So how, I mean, the, the uh, they, they published this, just like nowadays, the, the, the modern film is AES, right, the Advanced Encryption Standard. And, uh, I mean, the, the NSA says, if you're the U.S. government and you're, and you're trying to decide how to protect secrets, it should be using AES. And this was the deal, if you have, you know, classified information, it should be protected using DES. That was the standard. It was a standard for U.S. government uh, information transmission. So it's probably pretty good, right? Uh, it would be bureaucratically inconceivable, I think, that the NSA is like, ha, 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 we're going to have some secret flaw that, uh, that's, that's, that's going to be in here. Just because if they know about the flaw, then somebody else uh, uh, could, could figure it out, too. Right. So, so and in fact, as far as we can tell, this thing is, has been robust and designed to be robust, and there's no, there wasn't any fun business. But who knows, right? We're... Uh, we're now in the post-Snowden era, so again, trust in governments is kind of not, not that high. Uh, so, so we, we've got to, we have these lookup tables. I, I wanted to play with this. I want to actually just run some numbers through here and see what what happens to lookup tables. So, I, I wanted these things in C code, and this is a fairly common problem that like the the and I, I couldn't find the actual official standard. I guess in the 70s it wasn't real big on that. You might end up with like a photocopy of a typewritten page. <laughs> <laughs> Which again, like, doesn't like it's not source code, doesn't doesn't go straight into source code. The source code implementation that I found were kind of weird. So so uh, so, so tons of implementations of DS out there. So for example, here here's an implementation of DS, and it's there's that's six bits, and and here's here's another set of six bits, and it turns out there's a total of eight six bit quantities, which actually seems perfectly reasonable. Uh, there they have this thing expanded into two overlapping subtables. So their, their their implementation of it basically they they've got these tables so here, here's here's their versions of the tables and these don't really correspond one to one right so if you look at the first table sb sb one right uh, that is some some combination of the bits of this supposedly <laughs> but uh, but it, they they've, they've shuffled the bits around somehow I'm, I'm not I, I don't know what the heck they uh, it, 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 it's common that you, you you fold together any of the post uh, post table shifting you'd have to do into the into the table itself. So yeah, so 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 I mean there are tables out here. I mean this is clear in encoding of the zero, which uh, you, know, you have to say well, like maybe, maybe that's this, maybe not. Right? It's kind of tough to it's it's tough to figure out. So uh, sh 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 what I did, I, I, I wanted these things in a plain C readable uh, readable format. I literally could not find it. It's kind of surprising. Uh, I realize now what I probably should have done is Google for 
uh, this thing in a, in a sane order, right? So, so for example, right, this is like the middle bits. So if I want entry zero of the table, right, it's like zero, all zero bits, there it is. If I want entry one in the table, well, there's the high bit set, or the, the, that, that's the lowest, the lowest bit set. So there, there's there's this entry in the table. There's the next entry in the table, right, because set are next to the next. So, so it's basically dot, 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 right, this zigzag pattern all the way down. <laughs> And then, uh, and then you start on this uh, this pile, which is all uh, together. So, uh, so based on the assumption that someone has done this hard work for me before, you might actually Google for something like fourteen, zero, four, fifteen, possibly with commas. <laughs> it's no idea. It's like uh, you mean uh, in Burkina Faso? The no, no, <laughs> I don't. How about NHL division standings? No, that's not really? any of it. Okay, uh, so I'm I'm hoping for like DS tables, and I, I tried every variation I can think of for like DS tables, and uh, was unable to find. Uh, so you'd think, right? This would at some point be DS tables. I I couldn't look at it, so I I don't know. Uh, it may, maybe that's just not the uh, not how people think of the order of this table. So here's what I did: is I basically pasted these things into a spreadsheet. All right. So so it, once you're in a spreadsheet, the advantage of a spreadsheet is that uh, I mean, I, a Perl script or something would be a perfectly reasonable way to do this too. Uh, but basically, I've, I've, uh, I can sort of manually like align eight columns that I need or something, and and then I could do a, an equation, and I could say I could pull out the values, and that's uh, let's see. This may be difficult to actually figure out what I'm talking about unless we do that. Okay. So so hopefully, hopefully this will be clear. That but so all, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to undo this kind of bizarre. Ordering that they, they picked for uh, for Wikipedia. So so there's B zero, uh, B zero, and uh, there's there's uh, B eleven, and then uh, etc. So so well, luckily you can use fill right on a table. You can use fill down. So I ended up uh, so so I was able to actually basically just pull these guys out. Now the problem is uh, to put this into a C like or C plus plus language uh, uh, program. I need commas between all of these. So again, if you're doing it in Perl, it's not that bad, right? You just add, add that stuff. And I, I was very close to just like giving up and, and using a real language. And then I remembered, hey, uh, comma separated values. So I just save as uh, DS tables .csv. So I've uh, done this before, apparently. And now, uh, now I have to fire that up. So uh, op open the CSV file, and the CSV file has commas, right? That uh, I mean, commas are great. And then it's got all these stupid lines of crap. So uh, find and replace, search for a line of crap, boom, gone, okay. So l lines of crap are gone. And uh, again, this would probably be, this is not super scale, but th there's actually eight uh, separate tables that are wrapped, 64. So, so there's eight entry, eight tables of 64 entries each. So I, I just ended up putting little curly braces around each one. You could just, you could actually just say, hey, this is close enough. I'm going to have, uh, uh, I'm just going to put a big curly brace at the start and a big curly brace at the end. Now I have a big 8 times 64 entry table. Fine. And then I'd have to re reconstruct it. I, uh, I, I did little sub tables. So, so basically, wanted to play with it. Finally got to the point where I could play with it. So here's, uh, here's how you can play with it. So we're on that run. Uh, and again, there's, it's just an entry of 8 tables with 64 entries apiece. They're really not even unsigned care. There are, there are four bits output, and there's no data type like that in C++. So I, we're just uh, we we got what we got. So I, I used care. Uh, one advantage of this, in fact, one one reason you might do this, uh, lots of side channel attacks. If you do, if I do tables, big problem, right? So imagine I get the 16 gig table. Uh, most of it is probably not going to be even stored in RAM. First time I access a table entry, it's going to go onto disk and then load that table entry. Right, which is going to be much slower. So if you can just watch the disk traffic, you can figure out what entries in the table are being accessed. Hey, that stuff is telling you what's happening in the guts of the cipher. That's disaster <laughs> for, for security. Uh, uh, now there's uh, uh, table lookup is one of these things that has lots of side channels. Uh, in, in particular, right, uh, uh, knowing what cache line. So, so but lots of lots of known side channel attacks where, for example, machine uh, uh, process on the same machine is going to just be uh, hitting each cache line, basically doing this bizarre series of loads with, with timing timing code around it, and then just seeing, hey, what uh, what cache lines get invalidated. 
right? Because uh, if, if, they, if they can see what cache lines are getting invalidated, they know what memory access are happening. And uh, it's actually, it's amazing because in, I mean, less than one second, if you're hosted on the same machine, you can actually reconstruct the entire private key for virtually any cipher, uh, any cipher based on doing table lookups. So uh, one idea here, these, uh, these things, there's 64 entries and they're bytes, which means my tables are 64 bytes long. 64 bytes is the size of a cache line on typical machines, right? So it uh, doesn't matter where in that cache line you access, you're going to hit the cache line, which means you, maybe you're more robust against uh, uh, side channel attacks. Big, big downside of, uh, of tables. Nobody really knows how to fix this for AES other than don't let people on your hardware. If they can't read and write your cache with, you know, uh, low latency and high accuracy, then it's not it's not as easy for them to pull this off. So um, eight eight entries eight entries in our, our look at table sixty four entries each, and basically all we do we pull out uh, six bits. So this is a little bit weird. So I'm I'm going to pull out six bits from my data, look it up in the table, pull the next six bits in the in the uh, uh, of the data, look that up in in the next table. Right? So we we get the series of tables. So I basically just work my way through each of the tables. Uh, I'm, I'm coming up with uh, where my data comes from, where my data goes. Is you know I'm just pulling it out and sticking it, uh, sticking it back in there. So this is. Uh, so any, any questions about this process? So as we're doing it, I print out uh, where we're at just to see see where we're at. Uh, so, so, the, so, so this is essentially one phase, right? This expansion and permutation. So that's that's expansion and permutation. I'm calling it a, a, a DS round. Uh, let's see, I the the, the the key is actually this 48-bit thing that corresponds to the expanded 6-bit values, which I'm ignoring right now. So I'm I'm just XORing. This is not official DS, but it has the same combinatorial behavior. Sure, uh, we can we can watch the rounds and, and we get to, it's actually slightly faster combinatorial explosion than RC5, which makes sense because it's doing a lot more mixing. So, for example, if I start with one zero, the one basically goes through and rattles. Uh, right, this ends up in a couple of different look, uh, 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 table lookups, which means that just in the first round you've already really changed this quite a bit, and then. Gibberish uh, from that point on. So if, if we do if we try a couple of different values, so I'm just going to loop over a's. So for a equals zero, uh, that's not going to work, is it? Uh, I better have a sub i. I'll, I'll call the loop i. But the problem is uh, when I encrypt, I've changed a, so my loop is going to freak out at that point. So okay, so i. And I missed a curly brace. So we have, uh, so we're, we're trying some different script analysis here, of just change, uh, systematically varying the plain text. And uh, you can see that one is almost unprotected. Right? So the first, uh, out of the first round, there's only one bit of difference. Right? But, and, and this is because the, the, the first round, you take B and use it to mess up A. Well, B has not changed. It's exactly the same, which means that A has not changed. Uh, whereas here, these are, uh, the middle is the same, you notice. But then uh, th th this is directly affected, and then this is directly affected. I would expect that one to be, or no, it's just, it's just these two. So, so, so they're actually fairly minimal changes, right? Uh, the, 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 uh, it's, it's one bit over here, and it's two bits over there. And then uh, by the time you get here, well, let's see, there's a few bits in the middle that have not changed. And uh, so, so, uh, so, so, so basically our, our diffusion is actually pretty damn good. So again there, uh, the middle is somewhat preserved. So, so basically the, uh, the, the unchanged region, I don't even know if that's, that may be random chance. Uh, and we're, we basically diverge at this point. And then after you do this, by, after your 16 rounds, there's essentially no relationship between the two inputs, despite there being only one bit of difference. Uh, so, 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 I mean, this single step is, in fact, susceptible to the differential cryptanalysis that we saw before. Right? This is something that uh, definitely, definitely is a known problem. But then we just repeat. 
right? And it, it, like like with I don't know mixing bread or something, you uh, if if there's uh, if there's one little you know if you, have, have you ever tried this? I don't know. Is it, is mixing bread a reasonable analogy? Do people do that? Mixing bread. <laughs> Yeah, that's the one that our first two. Wow. Brandon's <laughs> 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 not here. I gotta make up for it. So. <laughs> I used to make bread. I do. Fred Meyer makes my bread now. So, and I don't know if it's better over there. That's the only way I felt so. making bread. I thought yeah. the bread was already like there, <laughs> and then you make it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have two lumps of dough. One of them has extra brown sugar. The other has, I forgot to put it in brown sugar. If I start like, so I'm, I, I glom them into one, I'm going to end up with rolls that are half brown sugar and half not, which is not right. I want brown sugar uniformly distributed through there, just like I want to you know, mix my bits uh, uniformly. So what do you do? You knead the bread, right? And, and uh, basically, right, you have like, it's, it's half and half. You fold it, and now you have like, you know, uh, no brown, 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 no brown. You fold it again, and now you have thinner slices of brown sugar in there. And you fold it about a dozen times, right? Now suddenly you have like thousands of layers in there. You fold it 20 times, you have a million layers, right? So, so in other words, you start getting this exponential feedback, which is kind of surprising, right? Uh, and and this, this happens in a lot of, a lot of places. And there's, the, there, there's only one bit difference initially. Uh, and, and that actually contributed to two entire uh, chunks that were different. And uh, I think I'm missing one. But there, there's a final round per view that I just totally skipped over here. Because I think that actually breaks the bits of this and then gives you more opportunities for diffusion to occur. So, so uh, right, uh, bottom line, right, a, a lookup table alone is not that good. Actually, there, there are several really bad things about lookup tables nowadays, right? A particular side channel is, uh, is pretty bad. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, uh, sm small lookup tables, yeah, maybe plausible. I, I, I get the impression to survive side channel, lookup tables are kind of not going to be the thing for future ciphers, just because they're that, that, that's one of the few things that actually didn't age terribly well about DES. Right? You don't. Uh, the, <clears throat> you, it's tough to rely on lookup tables nowadays. Uh, the, the S boxes, and and it's frustrating because S boxes. These are this is a very easy way to put a whole lot of nonlinearity. And, and I mean, it's, it's efficient at, at runtime. It, uh, it it lets you parameterize this thing. So a lot of a lot of ciphers like two fish, blow fish, they will actually compute the because the, the S boxes don't have to be invertible. They uh, they don't necessarily need to have terribly awesome statistical properties if you have enough of them or if they're you know layered on top of each other. So so a lot of ciphers where the, the lookup tables are are like you know, generated at runtime, and then then there's no doubt that uh, uh, that they're there's no worry that somebody has put in some special structure in the S box that's uh, you know secretly breakable because hey you know the S box is generated runtime based on the key in some you know, observable fashion. So so S boxes yeah I, I don't know what the future of S boxes is I know like uh, uh, Blowfish that's uh, uh, Schneier's uh, uh, encryption scheme the lookup table ends up getting embedded into the source code. So that it's not actually pulled from RAM; it's pulled from the immediate values in the source code. It's not not data dependent at that point. Uh, and and uh, right. Uh, so, so extra mixing. Uh, nice, nice part about a uh, an S box. If you look at any given column here, there is virtually no relationship to the input bits. Right? That there 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 is designed to be no direct relationship. So so you've you've actually broken up all the correlations uh, uh, inside there for as big as your really good table gets. Lookup table doesn't need an inverse. Doesn't have to be a permutation or something. It's probably it's ideal if it is a permutation, I suppose, because then you're getting the most shuffling that you can. But uh, if, if two of these things are 15, that's actually okay. That doesn't uh, that doesn't actually break anything because the the, the the Feistel structure of this thing means that we just have to repeat uh, when we do our when we do, do our decrypt. We just have to get the same thing out of the, uh, the the function that we got before. Questions. So uh, uh, S boxes standard uh, standard thing. S boxes can be pasted directly into source code if you uh, if you munge the values. Again, I, I was surprised at how hard it was to just get the S boxes into your code where you could look them up. <laughs> That's if you want their S boxes. Uh, right. So, <clears throat> so 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 DS. I mean they're. Uh, 
There were really bad things about DES. But there's one famously bad thing. So DS operates in 64-bit blocks of data at a time. Uh, basically, I read a 64-bit block of data. I have this known key schedule. I output a 64-bit block of data. So uh, just like virtually all ciphers nowadays, uh, if, if, I, if I take, uh, so this thing is deterministic. So for example, I, I, I run this through. If I encrypt the same data with the same keys, so if I encrypt 0, 0, with the keys of all zeros, probably not that good an idea, I'm going to get the same ciphertext every time. So if, if I basically just take eight byte blocks of my, of my, my plain text, run them through DES, there's an eight byte block of my ciphertext, that's not going to work well. How do you fix that? Right, they, they may not have any clue what uh, uh, what's going to come out for a given bit of plain text. But they know once that thing comes out, it's going to be the same thing every time. So they call this electronic code book. Right? It's essentially being, with your, your 64-bit input, there's a 64-bit output. If that's a deterministic function of, of your keys, if you read key, you're going to change it. But like given communication session, given message, you're going to have the same key, right? Uh, so same key schedule. So we want to break determinism. So it, it's funny that this thing ends up being ends up being pretty similar to a Feistel type structure. So here, here's one. Uh, so so scale, zoom, zoom out here. Here's one block of text that I just got out. Right, so here's uh, so, so there's, I, I have DES, and that basically takes takes my plain text uh, block zero, and I get ciphertext block zero. If I take plain text block one and I run it through DES, I'm going to get the if P1 equals P0, C1 is going to equal C0, which is no good. So all I do is I take the ciphertext that I that I created, and I combine it XOR is perfectly fine with uh, with my plain text. So, so, so they call this, and then you know, repeat. So, so this, this is cipher block chaining, or CBC. I, I take basically the output of the cipher text from the previous block, and that's uh, that's used to change the input of the cipher uh, of the plain text for the next block. How do you reverse this? Yeah. So. Uh, so you know what ciphertext block zero is that they sent that to you, right? You know what ciphertext block one is, they sent that to you. So you can decrypt these. I mean, plain text block zero is just plain text block zero, very simple. Uh, plain text block one, well, you just got to yeah, combine it with ciphertext block zero. Easy enough. So, so in other words, you can, you can just run these errors backwards, and then you, you have both of these available to you. So hey, here. Surprisingly soon. Per iteration. It's done at each iteration. Yeah, and, and uh, you can actually start with like a uh, uh, initialization vector, and that's actually used to modify the plain text, <coughs> and then you have to send that separately. So it's essentially just more keys. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's 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 not very key because we just say like, hey, here's the initialization vector. Well, you need it, right? So it's yeah. like you have to send it. So it's like, well, yeah. Yeah, just dependent on the startup header or something. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so, so it turns out DES with cipher block chaining and uh, uh, initialization vector pretty dang good. In fact, to this day, it's pretty dang good. The best known attacks in this thing are brute force, right? Which is that's that's as good as you can get. <laughs> There's one big problem with DES though. Brute force is pretty dang easy because you you have 16 rounds here. Each time you're reading like a 32-bit key. You know, that, that's like this enormous, like, 16, or what was that, 512-bit key, which is which is great. Or actually, the key gets expanded to, to, to 48 bits. It's a 768-bit key. Holy cow. That's awesome. That's total overkill. This key is not actually just, the, this, this is not the truly random key that, like, is the, the official key. That, this, this key, this is the sort of, uh, the key schedule 
is computed, and this is common, uh, it, it's computed from a simpler key of 56 bits. And 56 bits in the 1970s was a lot that was infeasible to brute force. But, uh, yeah, th th this is the one place where it's, it's arguable there was some sort of nefarious intent. I, IBM originally had said 64 bits, and then th there's this suggestion that maybe th there should be some parity checking on those, uh, those bits. Don't you cut it down to 56 bits? So, uh, right, so, 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 so the deal was uh, the, the keys were actually semi predictable because they were generated based on, and the, the key schedule is, uh, uh, it's, it's again actually just sort of this series of bit mixing uh, steps. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's scheduled from a 56 bit source key, which is really not enough. Right, that 56 bits is uh, is just uh, it, it's it's innumerable, right? That is, you, you can you can look over. I mean, it, it's a it's a lot. Gosh, uh, two, I mean, two to the 50th is a thousand trillion. Two to the 56th is 3264 thousand trillion right, possibilities. But we have computers, right? And computers are getting faster every year. Uh, di Distributed.net using this new technology called the internet in 1999. They showed that they could crack DS in a day. They, uh, this actually seems to be a common, a common thing. Uh, uh, like when uh, there's a there's a cool company, Pico Computing, that sells FPGAs. Uh, 2009, they showed they could put together a cluster of like one rack size thing, the FPGAs, general purpose hardware, right? Uh, that, that could crack DS in a day. Cracking DS in a day is kind of the new standard problem for this stuff. And if you buy an ASIC, right, those, this is, the thing is the substitution table is small enough you can you can encode the thing in hardware without too much trouble. Right? There's, just, there's not that much data there, not too many wires uh, going on. So, so this is designed to be able to fit in hardware pretty dang easy, right? There's not that many bits. So uh, with, with the, the small key schedule, you can actually have super parallelism in uh, uh, DS hardware. And it's, it's actually arguable what the fastest one ever was because I mean, the, the assumption is that like any reasonably competent government agency would have built hardware to crack this stuff, right? That that would just be something you do. So, so uh, again, this was a case where in early early two thousands, A six again under a day to, to crack this thing, right? So, so bottom line, fifty six bits was just not enough. If it, if they used sixty four bits, they probably could have gotten another decade out of it or something. I mean, uh, Moore's law, right? Every eighteen months. Your something or other is doubling. <laughs> There's a debate whether it's speed or transistor count, or it depends on which which of the various laws you believe. But uh, so if, if we double our speed, double our cracking speed, how, how many bits are we losing? <laughs> yeah, so so we lose one bit per Moore's law generation. It's not that bad. But if you start in 1977, then you know the the bits the bits fall away. So so it's it's kind of weird, right, that there's this sort of time versus complexity analysis that you have to do to figure out how many bits you're supposed to use, right? And, and nowadays, I mean, the official government recommendation is 128 bits, pretty much infeasible today. And yeah, you're, you're draining away one bit every, uh, every Moore's Law generation. We don't know what Moore laws, Moore's Law is going to do when it hits the atomic scale. So, I mean, maybe we only got like you know, five or six bits left before something's going to change dramatically. So, I mean, maybe it's going to take off. Quantum computers tougher to predict, right? But uh, if you just say Moore's law, you lose a bit per uh, per computer generation, right? So, uh, I mean, for round up, call it a bit per year. Maybe Moore's law will speed up at some point. Uh, but you know, if, if 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 we're currently at the point where like you know cracking 50, 60, 70 bits is not that bad, you might get 50 years out of 120 bit key right? before it's like well. It, and it's it's still it's not going to be like you know on somebody's cell phone they're going to be cracking this thing because it'd still take a long time to crack a a, a, a DS key on a cell phone, but uh, you know uh, c compute intensity right and as one person can buy a rack of FPGAs and they can crack uh, you know every hour right they can uh, be cracking DS keys, so yeah uh, more bits but I, I feel like those actually success this is how a, a, an encryption algorithm that that sort of stood the test of time for forty years. And uh, the best people can do is say the key isn't big enough. Gosh, I mean, that's that's a pretty weak statement. So questions about this? So how do we? Uh, could we modify DS to make it take a bigger key? 
Did you change the keys schedule, I guess? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's, it takes 16 round keys. So, and. Right, uh, and, and uh, even if I, so, so here I'm randomly generating the keys. Suddenly I have a 512 bit key space. And uh, again, it's, it's still deterministic, right? That if I, I, I've generated a set of keys, I now have to ship 512 bit keys around, but, uh, but there, there we are. So, so the real question is uh, how, much, how much cryptographic strength do we really have? And in fact, do we really have 512 bits of strength, or is it worse than that? And we're, you know, we're still good on the differential analysis here. So, so I, I now have this new key schedule, right? It's set up the keys in, in some new way. How safe am I really? It still looks pretty much random. That's a great question. I mean, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's the problem, though. My input data is only 64 bits. If I have this 512-bit key, which is awesome, right? But my input is only 64 bits to it. How many outputs am I going to get? There are 64-bit outputs, and because there's a decryption operation, there has they have to be a permutation of the 64-bit inputs. Hmm. Wait a sec. How, how much cryptographic strength did I really buy by going from a 56-bit key to a 512-bit key? You pushed up to 64 bits because now your new key is the plain text. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, there's, uh, there's actually only 64 bits of effective key here, right? Because there are only 64-bit you know, uh, input, 64-bit output. So, yeah. So I, I, I may not have actually gained, gained anything, which is surprising. I think, uh, uh, boy, that's embarrassing. <laughs> this, this is like your lawyer is never supposed to do. Ask a question he doesn't know the answer. I'm, uh, uh, you still got the yeah, the, the deal is one 64-bit input gives me one 64-bit output, and there's, there's some deterministic function there. How many such functions are there? I, I, so, so uh, one for any every one input, there's two to the sixty-four outputs. <laughs> there's two to the sixty-four of those. So, so I think it's two to the two to the sixty-four possible functions. Oh, no. it, so, 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 this is a little bit weird. If, uh, if, if there's a so, so this uh, so they might be able to sort of explicitly enumerate a plain text to ciphertext combination, right? So we figured out that that matches to that, and and uh, might be only you know uh, two sixty four possibilities for that, which is almost almost reachable. Right? But the problem is if I have a different input, I may not have an easy way to find the different you know the new output that corresponds to because it's actually two. I mean, two to the two to the sixty four is a big key, <laughs> right? There are many of those. So, 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 some, some, I, was, I was reading a paper that it convinced me that uh, you really only get 64 bits of, uh, it, it might have depended on the particular structure of uh, DES. It's making me think you may have, it's, it's not impossible you would have actually five full bits of security there. Okay, and, and any questions on DES? So, so the, the the key schedule. I didn't even look up the key schedule. But, uh, drr, drr. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the key schedule is strikingly bad, actually. So, I mean, we have this quote unquote 64-bit key of which eight of the bits are parity bits, so they're computable from the uh, the name 56 bits. But they're just each each byte has a parity bit associated with it, and then we just shift the 64-bit key right divide into two 32-bit halves. You shift them by a different different amount to make a 48-bit subkey. 48-bit subkey gets combined with those six-bit expansions of the 32-bit uh, on, on each uh, each bytes around. So yeah, there's nothing happening there at all. Yeah, this is really broken. Right. 
Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm done. Gosh. <laughs> DS was easier than I thought. And, any questions about DS? How about Faisal structured ciphers? Because that would be a fun one to. That would be a good homework assignment for some future. Homework. <laughs> No? Okay. Have a nice weekend. Okay. Any questions online? No. No. I... Oh. And, and you know there's homework, so... Okay. Yep. yep. Okay. Thanks for calling in. <laughs>